Hey everyone, my name is Sibin, and today we are going to be talking about medical science liaisons, or MSLs. To give you some background, I am a pharmacist by training and currently work in the pharma industry. I've been an MSL now for about three years, so this is just my experiences. Now my goal is to really shed some light on this topic because sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to find this information, especially in a video format. Now YouTube is my uh, preferred method of consumption, so Hopefully, if you're watching this, that means it's yours too. So if that sounds interesting, let's talk about it. So what is a medical science liaison? If we just break down the words medical science liaison, we see that it is a combination of medical scientist and liaison. And in this case, an MSL is a liaison between the company that they work for and the broader medical community. Now, as a medical science liaison, my role is to engage in scientific discussions with key opinion leaders or KOLs in a particular therapeutic area. For me, that is the neurology space. Now, key opinion leaders are typically the experts in their field. That might mean they've done extensive research or they have worked with some of these top tier academic institutions or quite a bit of experience with treating some of the patients in their respective field. Now, KOLs are typically going to be the ones that serve as speakers and moderators at these medical congresses. They really are the ones that are a key opinion leader because other experts look to them to see what these KOLs are doing you know, what it is that they believe and what they think about the science. Now, as the name implies, key opinion leaders are individuals that really help move the needle when it comes to treatment and are considered the experts even among their peers. So now my goal as an MSL is to engage with these KOLs so that number one, they are familiar with our clinical trial data, but also number two, to have a conversation about what they think about the medication or on how they would like to see a study done or maybe look at different outcomes that may not necessarily have been the primary or secondary outcome. Maybe looking at treating the disease in a different angle. You know, they're the ones that are treating these patients on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as being on the front line of patient care. The goal is to really gather these insights and bring it to our internal medical affairs department so that they can really help use that and understand how best to serve their patient population. In more recent years, clinical pharmacists, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and even academic researchers have started to fall under this KOL umbrella, especially if they play a pivotal role in managing the patient. Or in the case of academic researchers, they may have extensive research experience uh, working on preclinical mouse models that may be relevant to a particular therapeutic area. So the nature of these scientific engagements can look like a one-on-one -on -one discussion with a, a clinician. It could be you know, presenting to the whole group of, uh, at the healthcare clinic. It could be doing a presentation for the pharmacy department. So there, there definitely are days where you could be scheduling multiple presentations or meetings in one day. Now it's also become increasingly important to engage in health plans as well. So that could be providing education or doing a presentation for an individual that might sit on the PNT committee for an insurance formulary. Now if we take a look at the graph conducted by the MSL Society in 2018, we see some of the typical activities for an MSL. One of the reasons why medical congresses is at the top is really because these medical conferences might be the only time and place that you get in front of um, some of these top level KOLs. You know, if the majority of their time is being used in clinic or treating patients on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes these three to five day long conferences give them the designated time to meet with folks from industry. Now, not only that, uh, you know, these medical congresses are where the you know, cutting edge research is being presented to clinicians from all over the country and all over the world. The reason why so many clinicians come to these congresses is, you know, they are continuing their education as well as getting CE credit because this is where research is being published. And to be a, an, an MSL that continuously provides value, it's important for the MSL to be continuing their education as well so that they're able to speak on the same level as these experts, especially if they're talking about a subject that goes you know, quite deep into the weeds about a particular area. Now, it's also important for the MSL to attend these congresses because let's say, for example, I meet with a KOL that didn't have the opportunity to go to that congress, 
I'm now able to provide value by doing a small debrief of you know, some of the new data that was presented at these Congresses. And so by doing that, now I've also created value through my scientific relationship. One of the most important aspects of being an MSL is creating and fostering these scientific relationships with these experts in the field. MSLs can also be involved in clinical research. MSLs can help identify potential clinical trial sites in the territory. Let's say, for example, you have a KOL that's interested in doing their own research. The MSL might play a pivotal role in helping that investigator secure funding through something like an investigator-initiated study. Now, an important aspect to understand about the MSL role is that it is not a sales position. The salary and compensation of an MSL is in no way tied to the number of prescriptions that uh, a physician is writing. In pharma, there is a strict firewall between medical and commercial. And so as an MSL, you fall under the medical affairs side of that. While someone like a sales rep, they're considered commercial and they're job is more sales and marketing versus someone like an MSL is more into the research and development and education process. Now, being that the nature of these types of discussions with healthcare professionals are a bit more scientific in nature, whether that's because of the clinical trial data that you're gonna be going over or talking about the mechanism of action or the disease state, the majority of MSLs are individuals with healthcare backgrounds such as PharmDs, MDs, DOs, PAs, NPs, um, I have met a few RNs that have been MSLs as well. And I would say more prevalent now are the increased number of PhDs, especially in the disease state where preclinical mouse models may play a pivotal role in helping understand either the disease or even the mechanism of action of uh, some of these different types of therapies. Now, MSL roles are field-based positions, which means that you will manage a certain territory within the country. Now, the size of the territory really depends on the size of the company and the affected population. For example, you know, I work in rare diseases, so we have about 10 MSL on the whole team that cover the whole country versus a friend of mine that works in multiple sclerosis he actually has a team of 35 MSLs to cover the country. The size of these territories will really depend on the size of the MSL team. So for me, with 10 people on the team, I cover the whole Pacific Northwest, while in some companies, uh, someone's territory might just be New York City. Tied to this is gonna be the amount of time that you're traveling. So for some of these smaller territories, especially for something like just New York City, you might not necessarily have any overnight stays, but for someone that covers, you know, seven or eight states or, you know, possibly the whole country, travel can be quite extensive. Granted, this was all pre-COVID-19 and the majority of MSLs that I know, as well as my self and my own team have conducted all of these uh, interactions now virtually. And because these are field-based positions, you really are in control of your own schedule. You might have weekly meetings with your team members or your manager, or you might have you know, weekly meetings depending on some of the different projects that you might be working on. But at the end of the day, you know, you really are in charge of your own schedule. So if you wanna leave Mondays to do all your administrative tasks or um, Fridays, you wanna take care of expensive reports, you can definitely do that. If you wanna only schedule KOL meetings all before noon so that you can take your kids to school or you have to, you wanna to go to the gym at a certain time every single day, you can. Now for some people, uh, it can be a real blessing because they can really help create their schedule that works for their life. But for others, this can also prove to be challenging, especially in the beginning, you know, for myself, I definitely had some growing pains because I wasn't used to having so much control of my schedule. I, you know, I was coming from fellowship at the time, so I was used to going into work between eight and nine every day and leaving by five. Now, in terms of salary, if we take a look at this chart that was conducted by the MSL Society, and you can also see uh, the salary ranges depending on the number of years of experience. And I would say that this is uh, somewhat accurate. However, it really does depend on the company and some of the other different types of incentives that they give you, including stock, stock options, bonus. Now becoming an MSL can definitely be challenging as well. For the majority of MSLs that I know, they either did a medical affairs pharmaceutical fellowship after graduating from pharmacy school, 
or they went into something like medical information and did that for a couple of years before transitioning to becoming an MSL. Now for me, I had a feeling that the MSL route was the path that I wanted to take. So when it was time for me to choose which fellowships to apply to, I only really applied to fellowships that included a rotational aspect that would allow me to rotate with the MSL team. And one of the hardest things about becoming an MSL is sometimes they're looking for a minimum of you know two years of experience being an MSL, but how do you even get that experience in the first place if you don't even have the opportunity to do a sort of type of intro MSL? It, it just doesn't make sense. It can be challenging to become an MSL without having some sort of experience, which is why for me, that fellowship experience of uh, rotating with the MSL team was instrumental in something for me to speak to when interviewing for these MSL positions. You know, as a different example, one of my friends actually was not able to get a fellowship, but ended up getting a contract position in medical information, eventually transitioned to full-time employment in that medical information area. And then after a few years was able to, you know, transition into the MSL role for him because he was already familiar with the data from working in that specific medical information department. It wasn't as challenging for him to make that transition to becoming an MSL. Now the MSL role is not the only position in pharma. There are a ton of different positions that you can pursue under the pharmaceutical industry umbrella. And I am hoping to help, uh, help you navigate and hopefully have some one-on-one -on -one conversations with some of my friends that are in these positions so that they can help provide some insight into how they got to that position. If you like this video or if you'd like to see more videos like this, you know, feel free to subscribe. Uh, let me know in the comments what you liked, what you didn't like, and what, you know, what I can do to help answer any questions that you might have. Otherwise, catch you guys in the next video. Peace.